Today, no breath of life's allowed, for autumn spins her silken shroud. Thread upon thread, the earth is bound. November's needle makes the round. No wind may lift the fallen leaf. No flower split the face of grief. No flight of birds distracts the eye across the smooth, unraveled sky. So still the day, so pure, so bare, imprisoned in her crystal stare. Earth waits a miracle, man too. This is the day all saints pass through. seems to me one trouble with the present world is that people think they've got to change everything. Oh, God. Ice cream cone or sucker or a box of cracker that cracker that going to be a nickel, you know. But you think person my age and we live back in the past lots of the time. I mean, the sin as we have now, but I think it's because we have more people. Well, it was clean. There wasn't a lot of trash in it like there is now. I think it'll be a pretty unusual place in the year 2000. Smoke, I guess. Probably from trucks and cars and factories. The Bible says that men should not live by bread alone, but by a word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And I believe it with all my heart. What I'm mainly concerned with is the children. Uh, it is, and it just seems like no one does anything to better it. Another thing that's smog in my eyes is killing me. I think this would possibly be a very aggravating thing to me. We're all can only handle so many people, and I think we've about reached that limit. It's getting away from us. Pretty soon we're all going to be drowned in this mess. I think I'll retire in a rather crowded world. Water pollution, air pollution, and nobody's doing anything about it. I don't expect to uh, reach my middle age. In school, I say something, and people say, oh, why don't you shut up? Something that is constructive. Always destruction. I can't understand that. I would try to keep it to one. One natural and maybe adopt some. LSD and speed, heroin. Cherry Brown. 
It's dirty air. <sighs> he works hard enough because he, sometimes he has to work seven days a week. Never comes home. Mm -hmm. Crowded. Um, go to Wade. Of course. To a mass revolt. Mass of gas. And... I don't know what the answer is. The whole world's going to the garbage. A returnable type. Just swamps. There's a population explosion. Generation to death. Shortcomings. Terrible. Well, 30 years ago. So Dutch. I miss him. You remember too much. Well, slime. <clears throat>
Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome aboard 20th Century Airlines Flight 1980. We'll be fleeing almost indefinitely. They seem to have us in a holding pattern of some sort around the sun, I think. <laughs> um, unfortunately, it may be necessary to move some of you folks in first class back into the economy section. We may not have enough dinners aboard or, or enough wine. Um, of course, we have plenty of snacks. We'd just like to request that you keep your trash in and around your own seat. Otherwise, we seem to be in good shape. We have enough air for years of this sort of cruising. You uh, may think it smells a little funny, but then so does the water. However, you can reuse all the water you want. We just pump it right back up there, get it again. Now, in the unlikely event, there should be a temporary failure in the cabin air and water supply. A compartment over your head will open automatically, and a rubber Halloween face mask will drop down. Just pull it over your head and, and muse one another as best you can. Now, if some of you people on the night side care to look out, you can see the moon. Where are we going? Who knows? In any case, it shouldn't take too long to get there. Our tickets are bought and paid for, and we are well on our way. As you know, the population of the planet will about double in the next 30 years. We continue to multiply and expand, and our grossest national product is waste, increasing at twice the rate of the population amounting to billions of tons every year, rising from the earth, sinking on the surface of the land, and always in the end, pouring, settling, draining into the rivers and oceans. Leaving behind only the large rusting objects and the trillion indestructible cans and plastic things. Also, the growing trace of poison that accumulates in living tissue and increases on up the food chain to man himself. In this country alone, a ton of air pollutants each year for each man, woman, and child. Now there are hundreds of thousands of toxic gases which we can't even identify. New ones created every day by photochemical reactions high up in the soup of pollution that we breathe. Of course, most of the solids end up in our water, along with raw sewage, oil, nitrates, phosphorus, detergents, organic nutrients, mercury, and a thousand more. Our consuming thirst for unrestored quantities of water will soon be impossible to quench, as our residues are discharged ever downstream to assure eventually a septic world beyond the natural limits of waste dilution. There is now no corner of the globe that does not receive its share of industrial fallout. In the forests and fields that some of us have known, the marshes and estuaries, the plains and mountains, and the last of the wilderness itself, all shrink from the expanding presence of men. now paving a million acres a year. And those who flee from the countryside, which can no longer support them, in turn create the choking suburban sprawl of megalopolis and join lines of commuters who move at horse and buggy speed on superhighways built to get them into traffic-clogged cities where they can find no place to park their high-pollution automobiles, which most of us seem doomed to drag through life along with a growing collection of the products of planned obsolescence.
This is the bright future promised by technology. This is the utopia we have made for ourselves by coupling the Industrial Revolution to an expanding population. Now we will pay the price because our fathers progressed so admirably. Now the simple pleasures, the moments of peace, the things of beauty are becoming harder to find. Under a growing barrage of noise and nerves and electronic bad taste in the service of somebody else's limited interests. It must be realized that all of our environmental ills are byproducts. They are the results of the way we live and eat and travel, of the way we build our cities, of what we consume and how we entertain ourselves. And all of our problems aggravate and feed upon one another in ways that we don't yet understand. Many scientists now believe that we may be entering the twilight of human existence. And this age of affluence, of technological marvels and medical miracles, is paradoxically also the age of chronic ailments of anxiety, and even of despair. An age in which our fellow creatures face destruction within the same delicately balanced ecosystem that supports us, and in which our legacy to our own children is a rapidly growing number of ways to die. It is as simple as that. some good evidence that most of our people are deciding on a different road to the future. It's not without significance that the president has signed into law a unique bill establishing a national policy to permit conditions under which man and nature can coexist in productive harmony. A Council on Environmental Quality was established that requires that all federal activities be subject to review as to their impact on the environment. There is a National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration to do research on long-range pollution problems. The Environmental Protection Agency was created to mount an attack on the interrelated problems of air and water pollution, solid waste, pesticides, radiation, and noise. State and local governments, industries, unions, universities, and other institutions are working to adjust themselves to this new awareness. A more careful evaluation is now being made of the Alaska oil pipeline proposals. The jet port once planned for the Florida Everglades is not being built. The manufacturers of all our goods, from soaps to cosmetics to cars and soda crackers, are eagerly seeking ways to demonstrate that they too care about the ecological questions which trouble us. But these changes in attitude reflect that we, the people, have discovered that it's our air, our water, and our planet that are in jeopardy. To hold our institutions to making these difficult adjustments, we must reject the concept that the only freedom of choice we have left is in the supermarket. We must lay our hands on the levers of change and renewal in our society. The issues are complicated. Some of the choices and trade-offs, as the experts tell us, are hard to make. But if we don't participate in making these difficult decisions, they will make them for us. We can have the kind of environment we want, but the price is involvement. There's hardly a conservation or consumer organization in this country which is not striving to better understand and influence this movement toward ecological responsibility. We can join them. We can participate in the pollution hearings in our communities and states. We can stop assuming that we have to accept ugliness, obsolete land use, zoning laws, a high rate of noise, congestion, pollution, open dumps, and double talk as the price of progress. We can find out who is polluting our land and water and ask them why. We can be a thorn in the side of those who think our ecological concern is a passing fad. We could sometimes wish it were a passing fad because then it would go away as fads do, but it isn't. 
when enough of us have begun to earnestly commit to these principles, we'll begin to face the facts. In our free and open society, the first place to look for the ecological villain is in the mirror. Only then will we be on a high road toward the future. Only then will we have begun to take personal responsibility for the direction of this nation. After all, this is what our founding fathers had in mind from the beginning.